We've got your Raiders covered. Knock on wood if you're with me. It's Silver and Black today on CBS Sports Radio 1140. And now, here's your host, Scott Gobranson. Good Sunday morning to you, Raider Nation. It is a holiday weekend. That's right. Don't let any virus keep you away from having some fun this weekend. The governor of Nevada has decided to go to Montana for the weekend. I don't get very political, but man, I want to go to Montana. I've been stuck in my house for eight weeks. Holy crap. Anyway, at least we have Raider football to talk, and we have plenty to talk about today. In uh, During the show, two great interviews. Michael Weinreb is going to talk to us about the greatness of a one Mr. Bo Jackson. That's a great interview. You don't want to miss that. Also, we talk to new Raiders running back, Devontae Booker. Very excited about him. I think it's going to be an opportunity to build uh, some Much needed, I think, depth at running back behind Josh Jacob. Also take some of the pressure off him when they need to, which is nice. And so we'll talk to Devontae Booker. But first, we're going to talk to my co-hosts. And of course, bring uh, back with us this week, of course, is Chaz Osborne, the international man of leisure. Chaz, how you doing, my man? <laughs> Doing great, man. Holiday weekend. Yes, nice you, and, uh, sunny and beautiful out here in Vegas. You've been you've been hitting the links, man. You've been swinging them well. Yeah, I'm not swinging well, but I'm still out there trying. <laughs> <laughs> that, hey, that's that's the story of my entire golf game, by the way. I never swing them well, but I have fun doing it, uh, yeah, and I can always have a cigar. Pretty in my much mouth everybody, somehow. yeah. That's it. Also, our yep. guest co-host for the first time, but hopefully not the last time, somebody that doesn't need much of an introduction to most of Raider Nation, of course, uh, the pride of Central Texas right now, at least, right? Uh, and also the Locked On Raiders podcast is your boy Q. Q, how you doing this morning? I'm great, man. I'm blessed to be with you guys today. Uh, it's been a goal of mine to be on the show with you guys and just talk some Raider football. You guys are uh, great at what you do. So, yeah, man, just thanks for uh, having me come along with the ride today. I'm real happy about it. Well, right back at you. It's good to know at least one person thinks we're great. Yep. Um, <laughs> because, because, you know, you, you look at comments sometimes, people don't think so great. But anyway, but that's that's awesome, man. We appreciate you being here. We know we're going to have fun uh, and talking some football. Well, let's let's jump into some of the news we saw in Raider Nation this week. Everybody thinks it's a slow time, and, and we're on summer hours here, which, of course, every time uh, there's summer hours, we have more stuff than we, we can possibly fill uh, two or three hours with easily. And so, um, but we had some signings again, of course, Prince of Makamura signed with the Raiders uh, at uh, cornerback. And this is a guy who I think that is somebody who uh, is a sneaky good signing for them because I had a lot of people, of course, Raider Nation, always well divided and very, very uh, opinionated if you will, uh, on Raider signings. And a lot of people saying, this guy sucks, he's terrible. I don't know how you say that. Is he a all-pro type uh, back right now? I don't know. I don't think so. But what he is, Q, is he's solid, he's steady. Not only that, but you have Damon Arnett, you have Amik Robinson, both players who I really, really like, but they're rookies in a year of unprecedented um, uh, disruption with the COVID-19 stuff. They're not going to get a full camp. They didn't get OTAs. They didn't get the mini camp. Um, I think a really good signing cue for that reason. I do as well. Uh, I think it was a very smart signing. Again, Damon Arnett and uh, Meek Robertson, two guys that I'm very pumped up about. But with not knowing how long training camp is going to be, how much actual practice are they going to get on the field? It, it's just it's a crapshoot. Nobody really knows right now. So Prince of Makamuro, he comes in and he gives the, the Raiders the ability to kind of stabilize that position and even hold that spot down until one of the young guys is ready, because clearly Prince is not going to be the long term guy. But right. he's the guy and he could be the guy right now for the Raiders just to hold that spot down. Plus, he knows the the, the game. He's been around. He's a former uh, first round pick. I mean, he's a guy who's been in the game for quite a while, created a bunch of turnovers so he can go in instantly to that Paul Gunther defense and know what he's doing. Help turn the ball over. He has the confidence. He has the ability to make plays, even at his age right now. He's not over the hill. He's not a super old veteran. He's a guy that can still play and has an opportunity to kind of show the the young guy, Damon Arnett and Amik Robertson, kind of the, the ropes of the NFL, take him under his wing a little bit. So I'm very excited 
by the potential of of a Prince of Makamura, and not to mention, he's not Eli Apple, and that was a signing <laughs> that, or a potential signing that I was not excited about at all. Yeah, and Chaz, this brings up one thing yeah. that, that you talk about all the time on this show uh, with, with bringing Prince in is the fact that um, he c- creates a competitive environment again, right? Because, yes, Amika Robertson, they're the long-term, as Q said, they're the long-term solution at the position for the Raiders, but right now, why not push those young bucks as much as you can, especially with a former first round draft pick a guy who's going to come in and try to take the job right and then the other point q said is the uh, the virtual you know kind of world we're living in now where these guys won't be able to get the reps they won't be able to catch up as fast as a, as a veteran and you know mukamura his production has been extremely consistent throughout his career you know and so to add another solid veteran to that locker room and, and a hard-working leader on the field is really beneficial to the Raiders' depth. And, and depth is the key, right? We saw what happened last year. and Last team, last year's team, they couldn't sustain that, that early season success, um, you know, because of injuries, the, the perfect suspension, so on. So having this depth now, you know, we see depth at quarterback, we see depth, you know, at all these other positions. Um, it's, it's just more depth, the better, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, no doubt about that. And guys, when you look at this situation too, uh, we've heard all week about the Raiders and 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 Q. I know you've talked to some players. I've talked to some players as well via interview and and otherwise. The virtual workouts are going. These guys are spending four to five hours a day, um, not only learning offenses, defenses, which is all again virtually, which is tough for them because uh, you know I learned it with my kids, man. I learned it with working from home. You know, to, to it's not the same as being in the room with those guys, getting the camaraderie, especially in a team sport situation but what we did here this week guys is the nfl has said that facilities can reopen on a limited basis they can open for injured players we now hear some teams are going to open it up more fully next week including the green bay packers and others we haven't heard from the raiders of course the raiders are still building their facility in las vegas and henderson but they're also still working out of alameda so we'll see what happens with the raiders but guys this is very encouraging to me that if they can get these players hopefully back in the next few weeks we're coming up on the beginning of june so if we can get those guys in there by the middle of the month or so then a lot of these rookies a lot of the 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 things that we're used to players getting in and doing work can start to happen yeah exactly and, and that's the thing that you want man you want them to be able to get some of that actual activity on the grass you want to get them interacting with the, their fellow teammates and just especially for these rookies man it's it's a difficult ball game. It's not just playing football. It's being an NFL professional. You know what I mean? It's it's different than it is in college and having a set schedule. You've got to be able to do that yourself. So you're going to need a Prince of Makamura to go to Damon Arnett and say, hey, not only is this what you do after practice, but this is how you help get your body back. This is how you, you know, eat right at night. This is how you, you know, work out, but don't work out too much on your own. I mean, this is how you balance out what you have to do so you can be in prime shape for Sundays, you know? So it's it's more than just learning the scheme and learning the plays because a lot of these guys are sharp, man, and they're coming from some big-time schools. Prince, uh, Prince Mark Murrah is going to be talking to Damon Arnett, who came from Ohio State. I mean, you know, how many Clemson players were on the Raiders? So <laughs> there's, you know what I mean? There's players that are coming from big-time organizations and programs, but they're not in the NFL, and so it's just a different animal. That's what they really are going to have to try to get acclimated as fast as they can. Right, and as we sit, right. as we sit here on May twenty fourth, guys, you know we we still don't know a lot, right? We still don't know. We know the NFL is planning on proceeding with this the schedule as is. We still don't know. The big question becomes, especially for those of us, I mean anybody across the country, of course, but especially. For those of us in Las Vegas who have a brand new stadium sitting here, 65,000 seats, the field turf, the uh, the natural turf, I should say, at Allegiant Stadium was laid last week. Uh, you can check out our YouTube channel um, for Silver and Black Today uh, dot com, and you can see drone video that we shot this week. Uh, the facility is done. 65% of the seats are in. The question, guys, is are there going to be fans in the stands? We're starting to see positive numbers beating this virus all over the country um, and I just I cannot imagine the problems that would be created if you can have fans in the stands in one area and not in the other and then if you have to go you know for competitive balance reasons say no fans at all anywhere then you have revenue issues for the NFL it's about 30 percent of the revenue I think from uh, from tickets for for the t- most teams um, guys do you see again we're just guessing but look in your crystal ball and tell me do do we have a football season with fans in the stands 
at Allegiant Stadium in 2020. Go ahead, Chaz. <laughs> you go first, Chaz. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I mean, the positive Chaz is going to say yes, right? But I, I'm yeah. trying to think of all these different scenarios. And, like, um, I, I think you're a little high on your, your um, percentage for the team's revenue. I really think, you know, in my experience anyway, it's ticket sales are about 10% of the team's revenue. So, you know, to hear these to hear these owners complaining about losing money, they're not losing money, they're just not making as much as they would, right? But to go back to the, the fans in the stands, I was kind of thinking personally of maybe having like a, a quarter of the stadium, right? Like a quarter of the fans in there. So each fan that has um, season tickets, they get to go to two games, right, instead of eight. But then you're going to have the problem of like, well, which two games do I get? Do I, get to, I get the Chargers and the Broncos? No, I want to see the Tom Brady and I want to see the – you know, the Saints, and then and then if you're up in the nosebleeds, you're going to be looking down at all those empty seats like, yeah, I can get down there, and then that, that's going to cause problems. So, you know, the, with the logistics, I just don't know how – And it, like you said, Scott, you either have to have fans every, at all stadiums or no fans at all because the competitiveness, the imbalance of having, you know, the home field advantage with fans and then not having any, that's, that's a huge advantage. I, I believe that there's going to be fans in the stands. It's not going to be full capacity, but I do believe there's going to be fans there. And, you know, you, you threw out some numbers about as far as uh, the revenue that they'll lose. And, 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 you know, Chaz is right when, OK, they're not just going to they're just not going to make as much as they normally would. But I still believe, you know, when it comes to ticket sales, when it comes to concessions, when it comes to parking, when it comes to uh, the, the shop, the gift shop. I mean, that's a lot of money that is going to be lost. And ultimately, the NFL and every single one of the teams, including the Raiders, are a revenue-creating machine. And the Raiders are really on top of their A-game as far as revenue-creating right now with this move to Las Vegas. So I think they're going to do everything in their ability as safely as possible without pushing the, the, you know, the limit and, and the edge and being un, unsafe. I think they're going to do everything they can to get as many fans in there as possible, again, and, and be reasonable at the same time. Like I saw the Pittsburgh Steelers are only going to sell – 50% of their open seats. You know what I mean? They're not going to sell 100% because, well, they don't feel like 100% are going to be able to get in. That might be a smart approach to take. Raiders clearly can't do that because, uh, you know. Yeah, the, demand. The, the, it's already <laughs> sold. I mean, the, right. yeah, they're already out there. Tickets are already sold. So, I mean, they have some decisions to make. But ultimately, I do believe once that first game happens, you'll see some fans there. I just don't know how many. Well, it's interesting, too, because if you look at, according to Forbes just uh, this week, if you look mm-hmm. at the, the top 10 NFL teams, uh, the Dallas Cowboys derive almost uh, three quarters of their revenue from team stadium revenue. Right, that's yep. the highest. They they have a nine yep. nine fifty total million revenue, six twenty one because of Jerry World is such a big thing. The Patriots half of their revenue comes from in stadium revenue. The Raiders are projected to only have seventy seven million of in stadium revenue, which is I think on the very low side, uh, with a total of three hundred fifty seven. Uh, total revenue for the year. So as you can see, and that was for that was basically based on the 2018 season. They're modeling, so right. it's going to be off. But yeah, that's where the 30 percent comes from. But but I agree with you guys. I think there'll be some sort of hybrid. Maybe they don't let everybody in, and there certainly is some interesting uh, tidbits there when you have a new stadium and a bunch of PSL sold. All right, well we're coming up against the first break. Q Chaz and I will be back. We're going to be up next uh, in the next segment. We're going to be talking to Michael Weinreb. He is the author of several sports books spent some time one-on-one time with the great Bo Jackson a couple years ago. We're going to talk to him about the question on whether or not is Bo Jackson the best Raider athlete ever and pure and simple. Is he the best professional athlete ever? Uh, We'll talk to him next. Don't go anywhere. You're listening to the silver and black today here on CBS sports radio, 1140. This is silver and black today live on CBS sports radio, 1140. Welcome back to the Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio in Las Vegas. And we roll on on this Sunday. Joining us now as we go out on the phone line is journalist and author Michael Weinreb. Michael is the author of three critically acclaimed books, The Kings of New York, which is a really cool book chronicling a Brooklyn High School's chess team, Season of Saturdays, a look at college football through 14 games, and then Bigger Than the Game, which is what we're going to talk to him about today, which is a great book. If you haven't read this book, Bigger Than the Game, the whole the whole title, by the way, is Bigger Than the Game, Bo, Boz, the Punky QB, and how the 80s created this celebrity athlete. And as someone who grew up in the 80s, yes, I'm that old. Um, I appreciated it very much. But we're here to talk with Michael about Bo Jackson. But Michael, first of all, your first time here on the show. I appreciate you being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. 
All right. So so let's jump in on this uh, with, with Bo Jackson in particular. In your book, I think it does such a great job of really positioning what the 1980s were like. I mean, you, you talk about the political situation, kind of what was happening in the country economically, and then how these athletes were born out of that. And really what, what people are accustomed today to today with athletes making lots of money, being everywhere, being quote unquote brands in of themselves really started with some of these guys. And for younger listeners, right, that, that might not have been around, we have a lot of folks who came after this time frame. Uh, talk to us about Bo Jackson. When we talk about Bo Jackson, a lot of people know his mythic proportions. They've seen him crack the bat over his helmet. They've seen the run, the running over of Brian Bosworth. But for those younger viewers, talk about the amazing athlete he was from a very young age and put that in context for us. Yeah, it's interesting because we just watched, what, 10 hours of Michael Jordan. And you think about it, and if Bo hadn't uh, you know, injured his hip when he did, we might be watching 10 hours about Bo Jackson right now. That's the kind of athlete he was. And, you know, if you, if you look back at a certain point in the 80s, he was a bigger cultural figure than even Michael Jordan was. And it started when he was really young. He was just this um, this freakish athlete who, who uh, you know, the people around him had just never seen anything like him before coming up in Alabama. And, you know, his high school coach talks about him, you know, being in a, in a in a shallow pond and just doing a backflip in the middle of a shallow pond, you sort of hear, hear these stories about him, and you think they can't possibly be true. <laughs> but then the things that you actually saw him do in public and that are on film are so incredible that you realize that a lot of these stories probably were true. And I just don't think, you know, I, I don't know if we'll ever have an athlete like that again you know, given how much media and how much scrutiny there is of things that, that it just felt like Bo was almost outside of time itself in a way. Michael, as much as we love to see Bo Jackson run over the bars and run up the tunnel on the football field, if he had decided to concentrate on baseball, especially what we know about the running back position of football now, if he had just concentrated on baseball his career, how great would he have been? What do you think we'd be talking about today? Yeah, there's a lot of kind of back and forth about like how good of a baseball player he would be, but it's it's not. I mean, it's hard not to think that he would have been at least a very good baseball player. He was already getting to that point, you know, after his first few years, after he decided to choose baseball first, um, before he kind of became a part-time player. There were there were a lot of people who sort of just just saw him getting better and better, and he hit that famous home run at the All Star game, you know, and, and you could sort of see his trajectory going up in baseball. Um, you know, so it is possible that, that, you know, he, he might've been a, a hall of fame baseball player. It's also possible. He might've been a hall of fame football player. And it's possible that he might've, you know, been great in both, if not for the, the injury that had taken him down at just, at just the point when it felt like that, that was becoming a real possibility. Yeah, there's no question. Again, we're talking to uh, author Michael Weinreb, who wrote Bigger Than the Game. Of course, the subject is Bo Jackson. And and Michael, when you look at Bo Jackson, you talked about him from an early age. I mean, in your book, you talk about it. As a 10-year-old catcher playing baseball, he was throwing out runners from his knees. He had to play in adult baseball leagues because he couldn't get challenged with kids. He didn't need practice. In fact, he won the state decathlon championship in Alabama without having to run the final event, which was the mile. And he didn't even practice um, the javelin, right? He Or the pole vault, excuse me. He, he did the pole vault without even practicing. Bo Jackson, from an athletic standpoint, uh, here is a guy, and you, you have a great phrase in there, uh, which you call him Paul. Paul Bunyan on cleats, right? You spent time individually, and that's in the book, uh, with Bo Jackson at his home, driving around with him, which are great stories. With Bo Jackson, though, motivation is everything for him. He's not, he was not motivated to win the Heisman Trophy. He was not motivated to necessarily be the quote-unquote greatest athlete ever. What was his motivation as an individual and in athletics? It's a really good question, and I don't even know, you know, after spending time with him, you know, all those years ago, like, that I really fully picked up on what it was. I mean, I think he just, almost, I think he almost enjoyed building this myth around himself and sort of being this larger than life figure. Um, I don't, I, at least I didn't get the sense that he ever felt that much regret about the way things ended or anything, you know, or, or the fact that maybe the, that obviously he didn't fully live up to his potential because of his injury. I don't think it really bothered him that much. He just seemed so self-contained about it. And he felt like this was the way that, that, that you know, the plan kind of worked out for me. 
So it, that, it's a really good question, and I don't know if I have the answer to it in terms of you know what his motivations were. This isn't the, this isn't the Michael jo- Jordan story in that way. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't think Bo is kind of driven in the same way, and um, you know, as hyper competitive as Jordan was, I think he just enjoyed playing sports. And I don't want to say that he wasn't competitive at all because obviously he was, but I don't think that he had that that same sort of drive that that Jordan did um I think he it was more sort of about playing for joy that's always kind of what it felt like when you were watching Bo it just it was such a joyful experience and the people who have seen the the 30 for 30 about him you know I thought they did a really good job of capturing that the, the sense that you know that 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 everything he was doing there was just such happiness and such joy around it mm-hmm. they, they, it was just contagious you just everybody loves watching highlights of Bo. Everybody loved playing Tech Mobile with Bo with, with Bo as their character. You know, it was like it was just like there was just there was no um there was no sort of downside to it. It was just it was just great to watch and and, and just so much fun. It's it's funny because I, I was thinking love of the game. You know, that was that was uh, the way I was thinking of it just because we talk about some athletes these days and they hold out for all this big money and it, it just seemed like Bo with his smile and the way he was out there playing that it was just about that. It was just about the love of the game and almost kid-like, just going outside and play. You know, just go, go do what you do and that's kind of why he was so good at everything. How big, Michael, was, was uh, Bo Jackson as far as, you know, all the endorsements and, and starting to get the ball rolling? We know what MJ meant to Nike, but how big was Bo being able to be kind of the ambassador for a lot of different sports and, and just that that figure in a lot of young people's eyes? Yeah, I mean, Bo was, you know, the, the other big Nike spokesman back in the late 80s. And, and you know, the whole Bo Knows campaign was, that was, that was bigger than Jordan for, for at least a couple of years. Um, you know, so, so I think obviously he sort of built a lot of that up and and then Jordan sort of rode the wave, you know, for a longer period of time. But just in terms of the way he changed marketing, the way that he changed the, you know, what an athlete could be and how they sort of sell themselves. Um, a lot of that goes back to Bo and, and, sort of the way that Nike was able to build that whole campaign around him. It was, it was a a huge deal. I mean, you can't emphasize enough, like what a, what a big deal that that whole campaign was and just how big a cultural figure Bo was, Um, you know, and it was interesting too, because, you know, talking about the Raiders, obviously that, you know, and then talking about Bo and his, you know, competitiveness and things, but, you know, obviously he, he, the one thing he would do is he would hold grudges. And that was the reason that, you know, he didn't go to Tampa Bay and then he held out and decided to play baseball instead. It was because he had some grudges against, you know, some some people in Tampa Bay and, and, you know, wound up going to the Raiders instead, which was probably much better for his image and for who he was just because of who the Raiders were. So, you know, I think he was he was he was smart and he was savvy in that way um, that he sort of understood how the marketing world was going to use him. And he was like, I'm going to let them use me in, in these ways, but I'm still going to sort of own who I am and who I want to be. Yeah. And that, and, and again, we're talking to Michael Weinreb, who's a, a author, sports journalist, and we're talking about Bo Jackson. And that's the thing to me, you mentioned the, the grudge with the Buccaneers being selected first in the 1986 draft by Tampa Bay, then being fooled into flying down to see them on uh, owner Hugh Culverhouse's jet and then being ineligible the next baseball season at Auburn because of it. And he really held that grudge. So he held out. And it really was. You talk about the Raiders being the perfect fit for him because Al Davis, I mean, you look at Al Davis. Al Davis, one of his big mantras was, let the player be who they are. We don't have to bend to who they, we want them to be. Bring them in and, and let them be who they are. And that was, that was, I think, why that marriage, even though he wasn't playing a full season with the Raiders, it was why it worked so well. And then, of course, as you mentioned, the Raiders at the time in Los Angeles, media center, it allowed Bo to do so many things outside. And the Nike deal, like you mentioned, the, the new crossover shoe that they had just brought out, they weren't sure who they were going to get to um, endorse the shoe. In fact, you named in your book, and I did not know this fact for Raider fans, that Howie Long was one of their first choices uh, before Bo came along and they decided to go that direction. But, but having done that, 
that fit with the Raiders. And then, of course, when you get to 1987 on Monday Night Football, uh, and he does that, uh, of course, with the big 221-yard uh, game against the Seahawks uh, and and just cements his kind of legendary status. But could there have been, I mean, a better fit? for? I mean, that was the perfect fit, was it not? It was. I mean, you look at Al Davis, and he always sort of drafted, you know, these guys who were, for lack of a better word, freaks, I guess. You know, guys who were just hyper fast or, or hyper tall, you know, and, 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 and now they've always had that sense of like, I'm going to draft this guy and then they're going to just fit into this Raiders ethos. They're going to be different. They're going to be faster, bigger, stronger, taller, whatever. And, and Bo was sort of all of those things rolled into one. And you're right. I always, I, you know, it's been a while since I've, since I've worked on this stuff and I've forgotten, you know, the, the Raiders being in LA was such a huge um, part of that package as well. And, you know, Bo being in that big market rather than being stuck in Tampa Bay, uh, obviously allowed him to become that that spokesperson to become that that huge cultural figure. So it was all just but all just sort of came together in this perfect storm for those few years while it lasted. And then it was gone. And then it Mm -hmm. was like, you know, when I went to visit with Bo, I think it was over 10 years ago now. He had largely been forgotten, you know, and, and, and people had sort of lost that memory of who he was and, and what he'd done. The 30 for 30 hadn't even, you know, I don't think it had even been an idea yet. So, you know, I think there was this, it was so quick and he burned so brightly for such a short period of time that he sort of disappeared off the radar for a while and he was just taking care of his kids and living in suburban Chicago and people had forgotten just how great he was. Um, and now you know- it seems like obviously all, all that's come back a little bit. Yeah, it's unbelievable. It really is. And anytime I talk with Bo Jackson about Bo Jackson, it's always about, you know, how great he was, like you mentioned. And then you kind of go back and think about it. It was so great, but it was in short spurts. And I mean, we're celebrating that we always celebrate a guy who who ran for less than a thousand yards. He never had a thousand yard season in his career, but he was a great player. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, part of that was because he was playing half a season, you know, because he was playing right. baseball. But, you know, but uh, but you're right. I mean, a lot of it was like, it just didn't last that long, which is the, the great shame of it. But it's also sort of what makes it this great myth. Yeah, no, it's incredible. I mean, you look at Bo Jackson as a Raider, 38 games, 23 starts, 2,782 yards, 16 touchdowns. Of course, still holds that record for the most yards in a game with 221 in 1987. And when you look at this, Michael, before we let you go here, um, I, here's what I've contended. We, we discussed last year on this show who the greatest – Raider running back of, of all time was, I, I took Marcus Allen just because of longevity and what he accomplished and winning a Super Bowl and all that kind of stuff. My other two guys on the show at the time said, no, it was Bo Jackson. And I've come circle on that, not to say that Bo Jackson was the best running back, quote unquote, uh, uh, on the Raiders in their history. But when you look at Bo Jackson as a pure athlete and what he was able to do, the skill sets that he had, the freakish nature of him not having to practice and being able to go out and throw a football 100 yards in the air to throw a football up at the scoreboard at the Louisiana Superdome and hit it. Um, all of these things. Do you think in your mind, even though it was so short lived in your mind, is, is he the greatest pure athlete to play in these professional sports? Yeah. in the, in the modern era, at Correct. least, you know, obviously I didn't, I didn't see Jim Thorpe play or anything like that, <laughs> but you know, I would, I would, I think, you know, of, of the last, what, 50, 60 years of sort of the, te- the television era, I can't think of anybody who was a better pure athlete than he was. I mean, you know, you even even somebody like like LeBron James, you know, I I just I don't see I, I just haven't seen anybody like Bo who was just seemed like he was on a different plane altogether, mm. you know, like on a different plane of existence. It just you don't you don't see that anymore. And yeah, I mean, I sort of agree with both of your thoughts there. It's like Marcus Allen had a way better career and was a, probably a better pure running back, but yeah, in terms of like athleticism and um, just, just what he was able to do and the the way you looked at him. There's that great story of like of like Steve Largent, you know, listening to Bo as he runs past him in that Monday Night Football game, and the sound that Bo made was like a sound that he'd never heard before. You know, it was like an airplane going by or something. You know, um, and it just felt like that's the kind of stuff you hear when you talk about Bo. It's like people don't really even understand how to even now how to put it into words. It's like he was just, he was just so above everybody else. 
Michael Weinreb, you can check him out at michaelweinreb.com. Also, his work, currently you find him on The Athletic, The Ringer, and other places as well. He's, he's all over the place, a great, great writer. I highly recommend you pick up all of his books. He's also got a nonfiction book called Girl Boy that I would remind people about as well. So, Michael, again, thank you for uh, sharing your thoughts on Bo Jackson with us today. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. All right. When we come back here on the Silver and Black today on CBS Sports Radio, we'll talk a little bit more. The three of us will go through and ask the question of you, is Bo Jackson the greatest Raider ever as an athlete? You're listening to the Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio, 1140. Hey, this is Rodney Hudson. You're listening to Silver and Black today. Welcome back to the Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. And we go out on the phone and we bring in a very special guest, one of the newest Las Vegas Raiders, and that is running back Devontae Booker. Devontae joins the Raiders after spending his early part of his career after being a fourth-round draft pick with the from Utah with the Denver Broncos. And Devontae, hey, welcome to Las Vegas. Welcome to the Silver and Black, which I know you're familiar with the Silver and Black. Yeah, definitely. Um, this was, uh, you know, pretty much, my hometown team growing up. Uh, it was kind of a favorite team of mine growing up as well. Um, you know, I kind of had stints with, like, all the California teams while I was growing up. But um, it was just something about the silver and black that I, you know, used to like while watching them growing up. Yeah, and we've, we've, we've all read the story about your the, the Charles Woodson jersey that you wore out. Uh, and it says on the roster that you've chosen number 46, which, of course, is uh, the late, great Todd Christensen's number, a number, uh, of course, he was a tight end, but uh, another great Raider. So I know everyone's happy to have you in the fold and add depth and, and really some great character in that uh, backfield. Now, Devontae, when you look at the Raiders and you look at what happened with in, in Denver, uh, you didn't get as much touches. I know you're on the record saying, hey, you, you, know, you wanted more opportunity there. It looks like in Las Vegas you're going to have the opportunity to do that. What was it about coming to play for the Raiders, coming to play for John Gruden uh, that brought you here? Uh, I think it was just, you know, the, the organization. And, uh, you know, with Coach Gruden and the staff, um, you know, I, 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 I can just recognize, you know, real with, you know, the staff and just everybody. And, you um, it just seems like a, a a good environment to come come in and you know and, and play ball. They all moving, you know, everyone moving out to Vegas, and you know it's going to be good exposure for the team. And um, really, shoot, I just uh, it, it, like like you said earlier, it was just a good opportunity for me. And uh, you know, I, I think I can fit in and help help uh, help win some games there as well. You spoke about the opportunity and that you feel like you could fit in and, and do what you got to do there. But has the coaching staff talked to you yet about the role that they feel like you're going to play uh, you and Josh Davis together? Uh, not too much, um, you know, because it's kind of hard right now with, you know, the whole coronavirus and stuff. Yeah. And, and, you know, they can't really evaluate, you know, how they want to. But, um, you know, I, I'm ready. Um like I've been telling everybody, I've been excited, and uh, I never felt this excited since you know, since the day I got drafted. But now it's like just got to go out there and put in the work and uh, gain gain trust from the coaching staff, and you know, and go out there and put it all on the field. Guys, no, that's how do you okay. Think that they could they could use you best. How do you think that you could complement you and Josh Jacobs to complement each other? Um, honestly, uh, it's it's kind of you know whatever you know whatever I can get. Um, you know, of course I'm going to go out there and work my butt off to earn all the reps that I can get, but, but I could be used just the same way as him. Uh, I believe, uh, um, yeah, I could be used just the same way as, uh, Josh Jacobs, uh, you know, being, you know, running between the tackle outside and, and, you know, even, even playing a big part in the passing game. Again, we're speaking to Devontae Booker, the new Raiders running back, formerly of the Denver Broncos. And Devontae, when you look at the situation for you, as Q just mentioned, you know, a competitive environment, that's what Coach Gruden has really done as he came in uh, three years ago now to take over this team was create competition because I think for most of you guys, professional athletes, you want the competition because you not only want to earn where you're at, but it makes everybody better. You look at your backfield. We talked about Josh Jacobs. You add in the fullbacks uh, like Alec Ingold and, of course, uh, Jalen Rashard. 
hard. Um, it's a good set of folks. And then you're running. I mean, talk to me about the offensive line that you have the opportunity to run, to run behind. I mean, that's one of the biggest in the NFL, one of the most talented in the NFL. Talk about them and how that played a little part in you coming here. Uh, yeah, they, they massive. Um, they massive up front. Uh, like you said, it's one of the biggest lines in football right now. And shoot, I kind of never really had that in Denver. You know, so it's, it's kind of different, but shoot, I'm excited to get to run behind some, some big guys that like to block. And, you know, you have one of those, those great days, you know, on Sundays, then you can, you know, feed them, them big dudes, whatever they want. <laughs> How does, how does it feel to stay in the AFC West? You were with the Denver Broncos. Now you're going to the Raiders. And, you know, that obviously that's a rivalry. And it's 2020. Rivalries don't really mean as much as they used to in the NFL. But just knowing you're staying in the AFC West, what does that mean to you? Uh, it still kind of mean a lot. Um, it's a good division. You know, uh, all of us got to, you know, each, each, each time we play a team in the division, even when I was in Denver, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a battle. You know, we got to go out there and, you know, we play the Chiefs or, you know, the Chargers, whoever. And, you know, we know that each time we play them, it's going to be a battle and it's going to be tough. So, um, you know, we're still in, like I said, we're in a tough division still, but you know, we just got to go out there and, and grind and, and, and get wins in the division. And Devonta, when you look at the the Raiders and what they've been able to do this off season, you look at on the defensive side of the ball, of course, uh, the additions in the draft and in free agency with guys like Corey Littleton, and then on offense, you're coming in with a veteran quarterback too, uh, in charge of things with Derek Carr back there. Now you have more weapons on the outside. Do you feel like this team, from what you've seen so far, as far as looking at the situation before you signed with the Raiders, um, do you look at this this offense and say to yourself, "Wow, you know." There's going to be there's going to be not only opportunity for me as a running back, but opportunity to to really explode and do a lot of things that people might not uh, or people might be sleeping on this team. Yeah, um, definitely, and and it's not a bad thing that you know uh, fans or just whoever you know sleeping on us because that's what 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 we're here for. We're gonna work and you know grind when when nobody's watching and. Then when we come out there, uh, you know, they'll be looking at a, a whole different team that they've probably seen in previous years. But um, like I said, I'm excited to, you know, to be with this team. And, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm just ready to get to working with these guys and learn the offense and playbook and stuff so, so I can go out there and be effective as well. And I know you said how, how excited you are and pumped up to be a member of the team and have the opportunity, but – what about the opportunity to open up Allegiant Stadium and, and play in a brand new place that's never been played on? I mean, when you hit the field, you're going to be one of the first dudes to ever hit the field there in Las Vegas. Yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy, um, you know, just just thinking about it. Um, you know, it's my first time ever, you know, being on uh, someone open up a whole, you know, new stadium and. Yeah. Everything like that. So, like you said, it's it's gonna be it's it's gonna be exciting to play in that that uh you know nice dome that we got. Um, you know, I just see pictures and stuff from the internet, and I'm like, man, I want to see what's inside. Um, I actually <laughs> drove by it, like I actually drove by it before. Um, it's just probably like a year or so ago. Um, I think I was down in I was down in Vegas like a year ago like Memorial weekend around this time of the year and um, just driving past the stadium, all I could just see is just like a big black, like just big black bubble. And I'm like, <laughs> man, I'm like, I, I, I know they, they're, you know, they're inside. It's going to be like nice. So um, I just can't wait to see, you know, inside of it and everything and, you know, get ready to, to play on there. Yeah, and and Devonte, I know um, too. Wait till you see, and again because of, because of the coronavirus stuff, like you said, you haven't had a chance to probably come visit yet. But the team headquarters as well, and the training facilities, and I know they had some nice stuff up in Denver, but the stuff that they're building here in Las Vegas is is pretty remarkable. And by the way, you're not a stranger to Las Vegas, right? You played in the Las Vegas Bowl. Did you play BYU? Is that right? Yeah, uh, actually. That was my last year when I was at Utah. We played them, but I didn't play because uh, I tore my meniscus. But oh, the year before right. we played, Col- the year before uh, we played Colorado State in the Vegas Bowl too. So 
Yeah, I'm no stranger to Vegas at all. Yeah, d- luckily you don't have to play in that stadium again. Uh, I, I'm a UNLV I guy. Know, right? I'm, a, I'm a UNLV <laughs> guy, and I, I when I worked in athletics there, I had to work at that place, and thank goodness they actually have to play two games there uh, this year because of, of all this stuff and some scheduling conflicts with Allegiant. But uh, anyway, it's, it's nice always to see West Coast guys stay on the West Coast. We appreciate you, man. And, um, you know, for Raider fans who might not uh, be as familiar with you because they hate the Broncos so much and they probably hated you without even knowing you, um, <laughs> tell them a little bit to what to expect with Devontae Booker when he gets out there uh, behind that big old line and runs the ball. Um, shoot, really, I'm just uh, I'm just a guy that just, you know, fight for every yard. Um, you know, shoot, uh, I don't, I don't go down easy. I don't try to go down easy. I'm looking to fight for every yard and, uh, you know, just, just fall forward on every run. And, you know, I, I can, I believe I can do it all out there on the field between running, passing, between running, catching and, and blocking. So, um, you know, I'm just waiting, waiting to, to where I can, you know, like get the opportunity to where I can really go out there and shine. All right. Now, has, has, has Coach Gruden asked you to knock on wood with him yet? <laughs> I couldn't hear you say it again. Has Coach Gruden asked you to knock on wood with him yet? <laughs> oh, not yet. <laughs> I love not it. Yet. You're, you're going to love playing for him. I know that intensity. The players love it so much. Listen, Devontae Booker, I appreciate you spending some time with Q and I today. You have a great time. We'll see you out here uh, when you guys start working out. Okay, thank you. Thank you for having me. All right, you take care now. Devontae Booker, a new running back for the Las Vegas Raiders in Q. Um, he's got a great shot. I'm looking forward to uh, seeing how he does uh, when he gets in the fold. Yeah, me too. You know, because, again, we've been talking about it for quite a while that the Raiders need to find a nice compliment to Josh Jacobs. And if these two guys, who, in my opinion, are very similar, can compliment each other, that's just that's gravy. Uh, Josh Jacobs was a stud his rookie year. But uh, if he can have a guy that could be a similar threat when uh, Josh Jacobs is out of the game and just still be just as, you know, as dangerous, either by catching the ball, running the ball between the tackles, either way, if they can compliment each other, that's a win for the Raiders. So I'm excited about the opportunity that Devontae has. He's going to have to get out there at training camp and make it happen. But uh, as long as he's healthy, I feel feel like he has a good shot. Absolutely. Well said, Q. All right, we're going to step aside when we come back. Q, Chaz, and I will close out the show. You're listening to The Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. This is Silver and Black Today, live on CBS Sports Radio 1140. Welcome back to the Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140 as we close out this busy show on this holiday Sunday, Memorial Day. Hope you guys will have a great one out there. Want to thank our guests, of course, Michael Weinreb with the stories and the amazing discussion around the greatness of Bo Jackson. And then, of course, new Raiders running back, Devontae Booker. It was great uh, for him to spend some time with Q and I. And guys, um, as we get to the close of this weekend, you know, we're, we're, we're start the official start of summer, the unofficial start of summer, whatever they call it uh and football isn't that far away it seems like it's forever away but before you know it i really believe you're going to see july roll around you'll see those guys roll into camp and the 2020 season will be upon us no doubt about it man i'm very very excited i like the movement and everything that we're starting to see across the country feel like with this uh, pandemic things are starting to get a little bit better starting to see a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel and i know every state is different but it still seems like Things are trending, at least, in the right direction. Are we out of the woods yet? No. But still, seems like things are, are on the track, and the train is starting to roll. So I do believe that we'll see training camp sooner than, uh, than we believe. And, uh, yeah, it'll be almost time for football. And I'm very excited about what the Raiders could do in uh, 2020 at Allegiant Stadium. It's going to be fun. All right. Well, listen, uh, Q, man, it was great to have you. And we'll have you back again, I know, very, very, very soon. Thanks for uh, for being a part of this. I know that uh, we made a lot of listeners happy because uh, they blow up my DMs all the time to make sure we get you on. So we appreciate you being on. <laughs> Thank you for having me, man. Yeah. I appreciate you. Anytime you guys want me, let me know. Will do. And Chaz, my man, uh, as always, thank you. Yeah. And uh, let, just focus on the short game and then worry about the, the, the drives <laughs> later. <laughs> Oh, man. It's done. <laughs> it's Let's just go out and have a good time. Enjoy it. That's Keep right. Mind right. That's all that matters. All right. Well, uh, we're going right. to. Happy, uh, happy uh, holiday weekend. Same to you, man. All right. We're going to wrap it up. Don't forget to visit silverandblacktoday.com, the only independent Raiders news source here in Las Vegas. And make sure you subscribe to this. You can get this uh, radio show on the podcast feed on whatever format you like.
And do me a favor, don't forget why you have this weekend, and that is the sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice of the men and women who died for their country. So make sure you remember them this weekend. Until next week, we'll talk to you later.